We'll talk a little bit about sharpening our tools, uh, talking about our report writing system in a generic kind of way, what you can do. And then we'll talk about uh, some report writing um, and maybe touch on what I think are some best practices and uh, maybe touch on some worst practices too. Okay, so let's start with my philosophy. And as I say, heads up, this is likely to, uh, at one point or another, irritate the heck out of you. I have what I think is a fundamental question that every home inspector should ask themselves um, when it comes to writing the report. And what I would love for you to do is look at every word, every sentence in your report and say, how does this help my client? Because for my money, that's the goal of report writing. Uh, I am gonna tell you that I've been around since 1978. I review a lot of reports and I am gonna suggest to you, there's a bunch of stuff in there that is of absolutely no help to our clients. So let me press on a little bit. Let's look at it from the client's perspective. What do clients want from us? So to me, if they had their way, at the end of the inspection, you would look at them and say, yeah, you ought to buy this house or no, you shouldn't buy this house. Now, we all know that doesn't make any sense and you're not gonna do that. You're not gonna give them a yes or no. But what you are gonna do is give them a big piece of the puzzle that's gonna help them make an informed decision. And whether you're talking financial or lifestyle, this is the one huge decision that people make. It's super important. And we're privileged to be able to play a role in their super important decision. So I think we have a responsibility to provide them with sheer, with sorry, simple, clear, and relevant information to help them make that very important decision. I'm gonna suggest that a report has three elements. Um, I'm gonna tell you that there should be a summary. And I've had lots of discussions about summaries and whether there should be or shouldn't be. But I'm gonna tell you, whether you agree with me or not, we surveyed about 3,500 clients. And I can tell you with absolute confidence, your clients want a summary. And they don't want the summary at the back of the report, they want it at the front of the report. And I understand all the worry about how that might expose you to liability and they won't read the rest of the report and get the big picture. I'm gonna tell you, it doesn't matter. I think you need to be doing this. We've been doing it for 42 years. Uh, I don't think there's a significant downside and I know that there's a real upside in terms of client understanding, absorption, and appreciation of what you do. The middle part is the body of the report. That's the part that describes the condition. That's the meat and potatoes of the report. And I'm gonna tell you the third part is the maintenance tips. And I'm telling you this because I see so many reports where people intersperse helpful maintenance tips with really important things that are going on in that house. And the clients are not smart enough to understand what's the big important message and what's the helpful advice that would apply to any home they're going to buy. And I'm gonna tell you, you really wanna take all that helpful advice, tuck it in the back of the report, put a heading on it that says, important advice for all homeowners or something like that, so that it doesn't muddle the client's thinking as you're delivering your message. And I am going to say one thing I love about the home inspection profession is we are all so passionate about trying to help people and trying to give them all the information we can possibly give them and help them do everything right. And God love us for doing that. But you know what? Sometimes we are so helpful, we get in the client's way of understanding the important message. They don't have our understanding of houses. They don't have our understanding of the language and the jargon. I'm going to suggest to you, all that helpful maintenance stuff that's kind of generic, tuck it out of the way so it doesn't confuse the client. Okay, I'm gonna say that reports are typically made up of descriptions, what I'm gonna call in a disparaging way, kind of a house inventory designed really to meet the standards or the state regulations that uh, we have to work with. Then we're gonna have some limitations, the stuff that we can't do. And by the way, I'm gonna say, don't clutter up your report with a million cover your butt limitations. Don't repeat everything that's in your standards. I want the limitations to be 
things are specific to that site. You couldn't get into a bedroom because the seller had someone sick in that bedroom and asked you not to go in that room. That kind of limitation belongs in the report. The limitation about not inspecting uh, for radon doesn't belong in the limitations section if you add me. I'm gonna use the language of the software that I know, which is Horizon, but a lot of the software is generic and the same. So there are tools in most software to help you write these description items that are necessary evil and the limitations that are site specific. And this to me is not what your client is looking for. This is stuff we need to put in either to satisfy a regulatory body or an association set of standards that we work to, or this is a cover your butt statement to protect us because we couldn't do our job properly. These are, as I say, the necessary evils. Okay, I'm not gonna do a straw poll here, but I'm gonna suggest that most of you probably put the weather in your report. And I understand why, and I've probably had 300 conversations about this, and I'm never gonna convince people, but I'm gonna tell you, in my mind, reporting the weather conditions at the time of the inspection is a complete and total waste of time. It's a waste it's required of time. by the state now. It's required by the state in many cases. It is required by the state and I was going to get there and, and I can't change that and I can't control it. And if you have to do it to meet your state regulations, God love you, go ahead and do it. If you have a choice, if you have a choice, I'm going to suggest that you give it some thought because I'll tell you what, it's not there for your client's benefit. How does this help the client? Not at all. It's there to cover your butt. And those of us who have been around 25 years or more can probably count on the fingers of one hand the number of times that the weather at the time of the inspection has made the difference between uh, a quick resolution to a complaint or not. I just don't think it's terribly material. We've got hundreds of thousands of inspections, just not a huge deal. And let's say I'm wrong, because you know what? That happens quite a bit. And if I'm wrong, and if the weather is important, how about this? How about going to the website on the screen and pulling down the weather data from an authoritative government source instead of a home inspector? The information's there at your fingertips, at your disposal in far more detail than you are ever going to record it by an authoritative organization that can deliver it uh, and have it stand up if you have to defend yourself. So the information is there. I'm gonna suggest you probably don't need to bother putting it in the report. Let's move on and talk about what we call recommendations. And that's the stuff that's describing the condition of the home. It's why people hire us to do a home inspection. And my opinion is their focus is they want you to deliver something clear, simple, and consistent. And I have this fight all the time. Every home inspector with the big hearts that we have want to provide our clients more and more information. More is more. It's as simple as that. It's inarguable logic. Except I'm going to tell you that I don't think it is. I think less is more in so many cases. In elegant communication, getting the stuff into the client's head that's important and really matters sometimes requires leaving out some of the stuff that is the maintenance advice. Tuck it back where it belongs. Focus on the stuff that's important so that the client can focus. I like reports that provide everything in a nutshell with an opportunity to dig deeper if you want. So if people want to go and research stuff, they can click on a link and get more information. But it's that core message that is so important that I think we sometimes lose in the shuffle trying to provide so much value. So I'm going to tell you that if I can get you to get your head around at least considering less is more, and I'll show you some examples as we move through, I think your report writing gets faster, your focus gets better, you make fewer decisions, and as a result, fewer mistakes. And I think a report that is crystal clear, succinct, and to the point is easier for your clients to read and understand than one that is 57 pages of narrative with uh, single spacing and half inch margins. It's hard to get people to read nowadays. The world has changed. 
it's hard to get people to sit down and pay attention to the typed word. So I think we need to communicate at a whole different level, visually, quickly, simply. I'm gonna tell you that there's a whole bunch of stuff that most of us put into our reports. I call it site information. You can call it whatever you like. The weather I touched on already, who attended the inspection, the start and end time, the type of house and so on. I'm gonna tell you, if you wanna record all that, don't subject your client to it. First of all, we don't bother, by the way, never have. If you wanna do it, if you think you need to, to cover your butt and protect yourself, put it on a work order or something else. This has no value to your client. Don't subject your client to having to read it. I feel the same way about photos in reports that are photos of data plates. A data plate doesn't mean anything to the average home buyer. If you wanna translate that data plate and tell them that it's a three-ton air conditioner manufactured in 2015, why not just tell them it's a three-ton air conditioner manufactured in 2015? Why do they need a picture of a data plate they can't understand? Pictures of electrical testers plugged into receptacles with lights on the end of them. It's your job to interpret the lights and tell them that if there's anything going on. Don't put that kind of stuff in. Photos of limitations, I'll show you one or two as we go through the presentation. I don't think they belong because they don't provide your client any value. I'll get more into that a little bit later on. Here's my philosophy. When I'm gonna talk about a condition that I've identified in the house, by the way, I don't use the word deficiency or defect. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes as well. We use what we call the kilt method. So to me, if you were going to communicate with somebody about something that's going on in their house, I think it goes like this. Tell them the component, what is it we're talking about? Tell them the condition, what's the issue with it? Is it broken, squeaky, rotted, wet, worn out, old, broken? What is it? What's the implication? Why does it matter? The implication I see so often abused or neglected in home inspection reports. My wife is a very smart lady, but she's not a home inspector. So when I tell her our house has a cracked pane of glass, she thinks drafty, nuisance, should be fixed. When I tell her we've got a cracked heat exchanger, the only cracks she knows about are cracked panes of glass. So she thinks about it the same way. Well, we all know that a cracked heat exchanger is a life-threatening situation, but we need to explain that to our client. We need to tell them why it matters. And so many inspection reports fail to do that, fail to do it well. The location, where's the problem? Sometimes it's self-evident, often it's not. If it's the whole roof that has to be replaced, that's pretty straightforward. If it's an issue with the chimney on the uh, rear right corner, then you should tell the client that's where it is. We need to tell them what to do. What's the task? What should they do next? And by that, I do not mean writing a specification, not how to fix it, tell them what to do. And that would typically be repair, replace. It might be improve. If we're talking about grading, you're not gonna repair a grading, you're gonna improve the grading. It might be clean if we're talking about gutters like Charlie and Hollis were talking about. So the task can be a one word action item, what they should do. And then the time, which is optional, but I think super helpful. Help them prioritize it. Is this a right away before I move in? Is this a life safety issue? Is it a big deal? Is the house gonna fall down? Or is this something I'm gonna have to look at over the next five years? So we give our clients a time frame. So that's what we call the KILT method. Component, condition, implication, location, task, and time. And in my opinion, good software is structured so that you are encouraged to report every condition or every defect the same way. Lack of consistency, and I'll show you some examples as we move through. Lack of consistency in home inspection reports is a significant problem. If you describe something chapter and verse here, and on the next item, you gloss over some of it and leave some of this stuff out, it's not great service to your client, and quite frankly, it increases your liability, although I'm way more interested in us taking care of our clients. So what would that look like in a sentence? You might say the asphalt single roof covering, the component, is worn out and will leak, that's the condition, 
causing damage to the structure and the contents, that's the implication. The house and garage roof, that's the location, should be replaced, that's the task, immediately, that's the time. Not bad. So you can write that sentence or you can use bullet points the way we do. So we're saying exactly the same thing here. I find, I told you clients don't like to read anymore. No one's got much of an attention span. So I like a lot of headings, a lot of reminders of where I am, and then short text that people can connect and understand very quickly. What might make that better? Putting a photo with it. So that's the kind of communication, the kilt method, Again, component, condition, implication, location, task, and time, and have it set up in your report writing system so it's almost automatic for you to do that each and every time, to do it consistently. Okay, let's move on. That's a little bit of my philosophy, and maybe we got through that without too much trouble. I don't know what you're thinking. Um, let's talk about sharpening our tools. And I am going to say, again, software for home inspectors didn't exist when uh, I started working and when Hollis started working. It's not only appeared, it's gotten really good. So most everything I'm gonna talk about is probably available no matter what software you use. As I say, I'm gonna talk about Horizon because that's our software and I know it, but I'm pretty sure all these tools exist. So it doesn't really matter what software we're talking about. The concept is, Spend a few minutes up front in a quiet room, not on your way to or from an inspection, to set up your software to work for you. Because as a provider of software, I can tell you that the database that your software provider gives you is probably way more than you need. There's probably tons of stuff in there that you are never going to use. Do yourself a favor. Declutter it, get rid of it, hide the stuff that you don't want. You don't need all the stuff that is in most of the software. So refine it and get your items set up. Most of them have some kind of a completion check, what we call ours required items. Set up the items that you wanna make sure that you don't miss, like the weather if you're in a state that requires you to report the weather. Yeah, you might have to do that. You don't wanna forget it, so set up your software so that those things are included in your don't miss items. We call them, as I say, required items, doesn't matter. You can also, with most uh, software now, set up for any given condition, you can automatically set what the implication is, why it matters, location you may or may not want to do, task, what should people do about it, when the time frame is, and any notes, if you always find yourself typing in that same comment about, well, you should do this, or here's that, then you can do it once, set it and forget it. And then every report you do is gonna be consistently accurate and complete. You can also set up with most software, which items belong in the summary automatically, because it's easy to forget to copy an item to a summary. So if you go through, when it's quiet, when you're not rushed, when you're focused and concentrating, and say, here's what belongs in the summary. Every time I find a worn out furnace, it's a big item, I wanna put it in the summary. You can set that up so you don't have to think about it. Illustrations you can set so that they automatically appear for your client. If you've got a relevant illustration, um, most of the software, as I say, nowadays has an illustration library. We've got about 1,700. We set up some of them for you, but you can set up whatever ones you want. You can eliminate the ones that don't look quite right for you. You can insert whatever ones you want. So that's, again, great communication starts with a great tool, and that's getting it set up is hugely important. Templates is another tool. Templates in our vernacular is just a way to set up a whole bunch of items so that you can make one click and make a lot of entries. That's a perfect tool for, in my area, we have a lot of 1990s subdivision houses, and they're all the same. They all have a poured concrete foundation. They all have conventional wood framing. They all have rafters, uh, or sorry, they all have trusses for roof framing. They all have asphalt shingles. 
And all of those items, they mostly have 100 amp service, copper supply piping, uh, in our area, uh, ABS waste piping. You can set those up so when you come up to that house, you can make 20 or 30 entries of all that necessary evil stuff, that home inventory, those description items, and do it super quick. Now, you do want to proofread and make sure that nothing in the house changed, but it's a pretty powerful tool. So, uh, again, most pieces of software have a variation on this. We call it speed write. So, you can set up items in your database so that when you go to complete them, you enter the item and it brings up the next one automatically. So, you don't have to navigate, you don't have to scroll, you don't have to click, you don't have to move. It just gives you a refreshing menu. Every time you click one item, it shows you the next. Super quick, super powerful to do all that uh, necessary evil stuff. So, and it works on your phone, it works on a laptop, doesn't really matter. So take advantage of the tools that your software company has given you. Set the things up and use them so that you can avoid navigation, avoid scrolling, avoid moving around. It's super quick, super easy the way most of them have done it. I'm also going to say search is a very powerful tool. How, does, how do you navigate through Google? You don't scroll through menus in Google, right? You put something in a search box. I'm saying good software works the same way. You can put that stuff in. You can save yourself a ton of time every report by not having to scroll through looking for where stuff is. It's so inviting to skip the navigation. As a matter of fact, my mantra these days is navigation is dead, long live search. If you're not using it in your software, give it a shot. It's super cool. And I mean, remember when a phone was just a phone? Now a phone is a supercomputer. Now my phone, I can talk to, it's got better uh, voice recognition than a lot of the software you can buy off the shelf that does nothing but voice recognition. So instead of looking for a clogged gutter in a database, is the gutter, is that part of the exterior system or the roofing system? I can't remember. doesn't matter. If you use search, you can say the words and your software will take you there. You can type in a few letters, a few key letters. So for clogged gutters, C-L-O-G-U-T gets you where you want to go. Cracked asphalt shingle, same thing. Uh, buckled vinyl siding, same thing. And so those are just some examples. You can move so much faster. You can get where you need to be, get it done and move on so much more quickly. It is amazing. And again, it's just using the tool, like a scalpel, not a machete. Here's a couple of other things that I think are more inspection related, but super cool in most software. And that is, um, by the way, getting the contract signed before the inspection is to me super important to control your liability in part, but also I'd much rather start the inspection with a greeting, an explanation of what you're going to do, and questions about what the client might be interested in, instead of a dissertation about here's the rules of the game and here's all the stuff we're not going to do. I love to have that taken care of before the fact, and good software helps you do that. Getting paid before the inspection, we get the contract signed probably about 97% of the time before the inspection. We also get paid more than 95% of the time before the inspection. And some folks say, well, you shouldn't get paid till after the inspection. Well, who knows? When I buy stuff on Amazon, I have to pay before I get it, right? It's just the way the world works now. So we get paid 95% of the time before the inspection, which is great for accounts receivable and not chasing bounced checks and uh, bad credit card numbers. But more importantly to me, it's a great way to be able to end the inspection with a summary a best wishes, an invitation for the client to call you anytime with any questions, and to build that rapport and support that relationship rather than say, okay, now can you dig into your wallet and pay me? It's just so much more pleasant to do it this way. And again, all the software today allows you to make sure your client can't access the report until they have accepted your contract and paid for the inspection. The world has just gotten so much more powerful, so much simpler, so much better. So in a nutshell, 
take advantage of the software so you can reduce your report writing time and improve your report quality. The tools are super powerful now. Take advantage of them. Okay, let's move on and talk about some report, report writing. And I said best practices. We'll also look at uh, some worst practices. And I'm going to start with what I think is a bit of a challenge for you. I am going to describe an inspection process that may be a little different and it may make you uncomfortable. So I think a lot of inspectors are using their phone as not only their camera, but also their notepad during the inspection. I'm going to suggest to you that you probably don't need to take any notes during the inspection, certainly of the description and limitation items. And I'm going to say, here's an inspection process that might be a little different than what you're doing now. So I'm going to suggest that you inspect without taking notes. Follow your normal process, whether you start on the roof, then do the exterior, and then work in your house uh, from bottom to top or whatever, whether you do a single pass or two passes, whether you do clockwise and counterclockwise. Uh, however you go about uh, covering every part of the home doesn't matter. Follow your process, and as you go, when you see a condition or a defect, you search to find it in your tool, meaning your phone, and then grab the item, document the item with a single click, and take a photo of it then and there. And again, any software worth its salt will now put that photo in the right spot in the report so there's no downloading off a camera, uploading from your computer into your software, scrolling through a whole palette of photos to find the right one to put in the right place. All that sorting and so on, all that organizational work has gone away. That is a huge savings of time for each and every report for forever moving forward. If you follow that process, it just got so much simpler. Now, I've said don't take notes as you go, and that's pretty radical thinking, I get that. But I would say that if you let your software drive you, and again, our tool is called SpeedWrite, but whatever they use, to add all your description and limitation items, I'm gonna tell you that as you go through the house, evaluating it and looking for the issues and the defects, you are going to be able to complete your descriptions and your limitations without having taken a single note about them. And you won't, a lot of people don't believe that they can do it, but if you try it and try it on a practice inspection when it doesn't matter, but remember you're doing this at the end of the inspection. If you can't remember what the BTU rating of the water heater, for example, you just walk over and look at it. It's not a big deal. It's not a crime. If you've missed it, you just pick it up. But I think you'll be surprised at how a home inspector's brain works, collecting all that data. And every time you stop to make a note, you lose contact with your client, except in these COVID times when you might not have contact anyway. But it allows you to stay commuting, communicating with your client. And I think it's remarkable how at the end of the inspection, you go through and you fill it out. And I can tell you what, if you've forgotten to document or remember, if you've forgotten to remember the BTU rating of the water heater, you won't forget it a second time. On your next inspection, you'll say, well, just let me make a, a mental note of that. Yeah, okay, it's uh, whatever it is, uh, 40,000 BTUs. So uh, it is a bit unsettling to try it the first few times, but trust me, I have every confidence that you can do this. It will speed up your report writing time. It will improve your communication with your client. It's different. And it takes a little courage to try it, but believe me, it's worth a shot. At the end of the inspection, you're going to go back, at least in my world, we don't feel compelled to deliver the inspection on site at the end of the, uh, or deliver the report on site at the end of the inspection, sorry. Uh, we take the time to go back, polish the report, proofread, publish it, and send it to the client. Now, we usually do that same day. As a matter of fact, one of the other things I might suggest to you is, under promise and over deliver on your report delivery. So if you're gonna do it same day, say I'll have it to you within 24 hours. So always do better than you say you're going to do when it comes to delivering reports. And quite frankly, anything else that you're committing to on a timeline makes sense too. 
Okay, on the descriptions, we've talked about this, you have to do what your standards or your regulations call for, but I'm gonna ask you to be as generic as possible. I'd rather you say wood roof than cedar roof because at least in our market, and I've got some very unhappy home inspector stories to prove it, that if you say cedar roof, it might just be a pressure treated pine roof and then you're wrong and then you're on the hook for replacing a roof. So keep your descriptions generic. Plastic piping is fine. You don't need to say CPVC. You can if you're sure, and if you're never gonna be wrong, that's great, but simpler, quicker. Asphalt shingle rather than 30 year architectural or laminated shingle or whatever. The client doesn't care. You're not providing any real value here. The client wants to know is the house gonna be warm, safe, and dry. That's what they care about not these material descriptions. So keep them general, short and sweet, move on. It's not what you're getting paid for. Here's a good example. You've got to describe the structure, the configuration, foundation, floor, wall, roof and ceiling framing. There you go. Click some buttons, move on. Keep it simple. Getting back to your recommendations, the kilt method we talked about. So short and sweet, Bullet points I really like because our clients like them. We've got over 1,400 client reviews on our uh, website that you can look at. And the theme that keeps coming up is people really like our reports that where it's like simple, easy to read and easy to understand. So that to me is the kind of communication and an illustration and a photo going as a pair to me is a killer combination. It's I don't care how yours looks. I just want your communication to be simple and elegant. Speaking of simple and elegant, these are all things that get in the way of simple and elegant in my mind. If you use symbols and you use icons, cute little things that people have to understand what they mean, or they have to go back to a different page to find out what a legend means, or you have to describe stuff in a glossary at the end, I think you have lost a huge opportunity of using today's technology. With today's technology, everything can be exactly where the client needs it. If you need to explain a term, that term can be locked into your database with the explanation, and you don't have to send the client somewhere else. You never have to think about it again because it's there explained for them. Every time you ask somebody to stop reading and go find something else to see what you're talking about, you've lost the reader. It's, a, it's discourteous in today's world. Keep all that stuff out of your reports, I beg of you. Photos and illustrations I've talked about already. Is a picture worth a thousand words? Absolutely. I get asked all the time, how many photos should I put in a report? I'm gonna say about 15 to 50, depending on the house and we'll talk in a bit about exactly which ones. I'm gonna say, I'd like you to take probably another 20 photos to protect yourself, but I don't want them in the report. And we'll talk about that a little bit and talk about why. So could you describe that in a sentence or a paragraph that would paint the picture to the client that that photo does? I don't think so. Pretty crystal clear. And you look at this panel. This one actually Hollis wired this panel, which is a bit unfortunate. But I mean, words are never going to do that justice. And again, the illustration and the photo, such a powerful message. You don't need a lot of words. You don't need a sentence. You don't need a paragraph. And you certainly don't need a page to describe the issue here. This is what I was talking about when I said, I don't want limitations photos in your report. So here we are looking at a garage and doesn't this happen all the time? The real estate agent tells the client to declutter their house so that it shows great for selling. So they put all their stuff in the garage. I can't get in the garage. I can't set foot in it. I'm gonna take a picture of it and I'm gonna put that limitation in my report. However, does any of that help your client? Let me go back to that fundamental key question. My answer is no. So I'm not gonna put anything more in my report than I absolutely need to. So I'm gonna put in a quick limitation, garage filled with storage. That photo I am going to take 
and I am going to archive it with my report. And again, with good software, that's so easy to do. It does it automatically. If you don't place that photo somewhere in the report, it just gets archived there and stored in the cloud and you can access it anytime. So if a year and a half later, you get a call from a client says, I got a giant crack in my garage floor slab. Why didn't you tell me about it? You can pull out this photo and send it to them and say, do you remember when? But unless and until you need that photo, I suggest you keep those kind of photos right out of your report. I know it's radical. I just don't think it helps the client as they're trying to make a huge lifestyle and financial decision about buying a home. They're reading the report and here's a page with this picture and a bunch of words around it. What does it mean to them? It's just a distraction. It doesn't help them make their buying decision. It's neither good nor bad about the house, something you couldn't see. There are, and I'll get into that topic for another discussion and another talk about how else you should deal with limitations, but I'll leave that. So I said I'd mention what kind of photos you should include in the report. So I think almost everyone takes a photo of the front of the house to put on the title page of the report. I think a photo of the roof, the attic, and the crawl space, the things that people don't see, and in some cases, things to show the client that you did get there if the client wasn't with you. Now with the roof, it might be from a drone or it might be from a pole camera that you didn't actually get on the roof, but it shows that you looked at it. Excuse me. Um, so most inspectors take a photo of the electrical panel with the cover off, the furnace with the cover off, largely to show the client that you went to that effort and did it. I don't really care all that much about those, but I know most people put them in. <clears throat> I'm also gonna suggest that most recommendations deserve a photo. There are a few exceptions, but we won't worry about those in the interest of time tonight. I really like this phrase, possible concealed damage. And in fact, I'm gonna tell you it's your best friend. Just to recognize the possibility when you think about grout in a shower stall and the grout's cracked, is that a big deal or a little deal? Is it $25 or $2,500? Well, the answer is you probably don't know. So I think you're really wise when you see these kinds of situations to include a phrase that somehow conveys the message that there's possible concealed damage somewhere. And you can figure out where it belongs. I talked about sharpening your tools and using your software like a scalpel, you can build this language in to your report so you never have to remember to put it in, but possible concealed damage. I live in God's country where it's really cold and we have a lot of ice damming issues. So when we see a little bit of ice damming stuff going on at the eaves, I'm always thinking about what's going on in the wall below that. Is there a bunch of concealed damage below? When you see, do you call it EFS or EFS or whatever you call synthetic stucco, when you see some flaws in the surface, is there any chance there's possible concealed damage? Of course there is. A great time to use that. I think that's a super little phrase to keep in your pocket. I don't know that we need to talk about the code issue. I doubt very much that any of you reference codes. I sure hope not. Um, to me, Using words like current building practice is uh, a good way to step around that if you wanna make a point. Uh, I am gonna say that your report should be consistent with codes, unless you disagree with the code, and I sometimes do disagree with the code. But understand that somebody somewhere along the line is gonna read your report and they're gonna know the code. It might be a contractor, it might be a municipal official, it might be somebody else. Um, but your reports should be consistent with the codes without referencing them, unless, as I say, you're going to make a specific point of disagreeing. Um, when we talk about codes, I'm pretty sure you all know there are lots of different codes. They're updated on a typically a three or a five year cycle. No human being could possibly know every version of every code that's out there. A code inspection, in my way of thinking, is a completely different inspection that has a different skill set and a different focus. I hate seeing this kind of stuff in reports. Balcony guardrail openings violate the building code. What I would much prefer is something that uses kilt that says, 
here's what it is and here's the problem. To me, when we tell clients that their child might fall through the openings in this railing, that's a way more powerful motivator than to say, hey, this railing doesn't meet code. Because when you say it doesn't meet code, the average home buyer thinks this, well then gosh, I better not invite a code inspector over to the house. You see how they don't get the importance and the implication of the issue. So forget about the code rationale and explain how it's gonna affect the people living there. Um, I'm also gonna accuse most home inspectors of being careless and not actually intimidating their clients intentionally, but doing it accidentally. What I really would like you to do is look through some of your reports and see if you use any of the words in red in your reports without explaining to your client what they mean. What do you think? Yeah, most of us do it. And again, with modern software, modern databases, modern technology, so easy to help the client really understand what you're talking about. Set it up once and forget it. Um, these comments that I'm putting in here, I didn't make up. These are coming out of actual reports that uh, I've reviewed and read. So some of the exterior plugs should be upgraded to have ground fault protection, which was mandated at time of construction. So if you've been paying any attention to what I've been saying, there's all kinds of things wrong with this uh, one sentence. First of all, the receptacles, not plugs. The plug is what you push into the receptacle. You can also call them outlets if you like, but please don't call them plugs. How does the client figure out what ground fault protection is? No idea. Why should the person do something about upgrading these plugs? Because it was mandated at time of construction. So shouldn't they go back to the builder and tell the builder to fix it, even though the house is now 20 years old? Doesn't make any sense. There's no clarity for the client here. I would tend to not give that one a 10 out of 10. I'm also gonna tell you to avoid negative words in your reports. I don't use words like problems, deficiencies, defects, adverse conditions, even issues or concerns. We talk about observations, recommendations, conditions, and findings. And if you look at most engineering reports, you'll find they do the same thing. Let's face it, a home inspection is scary enough without us making it worse by terrifying the client with the words that are in it. I like to say that we are in the solutions business, not the problems business in the home inspection profession. We're trying to help people. We're not trying to scare them away from every house they might ever buy. We're trying to help them make an informed decision. And to me, providing solutions is way more important than identifying problems. I'm gonna ask you to stay away from all these words too. Satisfactory, acceptable, serviceable, structurally sound, functioning as intended, or functioning as designed. Why am I going to say stay away from them? Because you just don't know. You don't know if that roof that looks perfectly good is going to leak like crazy when the wind drives the rain from the east. You don't know if that basement's going to leak, as uh, Charlie and Hollis were talking about before the session. You just don't know. None of us that I know of stand in the shower when you're testing the shower and have the water bounce off a human being so that you'll find out whether it goes behind the escutcheon plate or down behind the soap dish and leaks in behind and causes a problem. You just don't know these things, so shut up about them. Don't put them in your reports. Avoid those words. I'm also going to give you some other words to ignore, and we've moved into kind of worst practices, in my opinion, rather than best report writing practices. I'm going to say avoid words like amateurish, sloppy, and homeowner repair. Why? Because they're personal. You're talking about the human being who did the work. You're not talking about the actual condition of the house. So if you want to say something is loose, uneven, poorly secured, out of plumb, that's all fine. That's factual and it's impersonal. You don't want to offend people in your home inspection report. So keep it about the home and about the conditions, not about the person who did the work. 
Okay, too many words. And this is a chronic problem with everybody in the world, not just home inspectors. Visible evidence of rodent activity was observed in the attic area. Well, first of all, you don't have to say the evidence was visible because if it wasn't, you wouldn't have noticed it. And secondly, I'm not quite sure what the attic area is. It's either the attic or something else, but an attic area makes no sense to me. The pier and beam foundation appear to have, do efficient, appear to have deficiencies that are beyond normal. What? They either have deficiencies or they don't. What does it appear to? I really want you to be careful using those two words together, appear to. Have the courage of your convictions. You guys know so much. You are so powerful. Don't be waffly. And deficiencies that are beyond normal, I really hate peer and beam foundations that are paranormal. Like, what does that even mean? What does that mean to a client? Remember I said at the outset, how does this help my client? This is scary and vague all at the same time and not willing to make a commitment with a peer to. The roof damage was observed to have, or sorry, the roof and material was observed to have impact damage. The damage may have been caused by a hailstorm and should be further evaluated. Okay, a couple of thoughts. There's a bunch of extra words in there that I put in black. Roof materials damaged, okay. Do we have to report the cause of damage? Absolutely not. If you can, I would stay away from discussing the cause because you might be wrong, but more importantly, because it doesn't really matter. And by the way, if the roof is damaged by hail or whatever else, and the roof is shot, what kind of further evaluation is going to help? I really hate the words further evaluated in a report unless it's something that requires dismantling, engineering analysis, or something else. What's a roofer gonna say when they come out and see a roof with hail damage? Replace it. Why don't you just make the call for the client? The roof needs to be replaced. Further evaluation is a chickening out in so many reports that I read. Being consistent, and this is where, when I talked about good software, allowing you to be consistent with that kilt method or whatever, however they do it, there are water leaks in the crawl space that need to be corrected. There are severely damaged joists in the Northwest crawl space. So let me see if I understand this correctly. I have to do something about the water leaks, but I don't have to do anything about the severely damaged joists. Do you think that's what the inspector meant? I doubt it, but he didn't say what he meant. Okay, decluttering your report. And I mean declutter again for two reasons. Save yourself time, grief, focus on the important stuff, but deliver your client a better product. So here's stuff that I see in reports that I think has no place in a home inspection report. Two-story, four-bedroom hose. If you have to be telling them that, they probably aren't ready to buy a home. The home is roughly 10 years old, so what? The real estate agent probably told them that. The house size is roughly 3,000 square feet. Great, the real estate agent told them it was 3,600 square feet. Now you've started a fight. What does it matter? How is this important to you and how is this your job? This one kills me. The swimming pool is located in the backyard. First of all, you don't need the word located in that sentence. The swimming pool's in the backyard. Why are you telling the client the swimming pool's in the backyard? Do you think they didn't notice? Wouldn't their feet be wet by now if they hadn't noticed that? Flooring, two by eight joists, 16 inches on center. So what? Can you guys tell me whether that floor is framed properly? Is that gonna be uh, strong enough? There's not enough data. It doesn't matter how much data you give a client, they're never gonna know. Flooring, two by eight on 16 inch center, spanning nine foot six, there's a little more data. Does that tell you? Now can you tell me that the floor is fine? Of course not. You don't know anything about bridging, break, break, bridging, bracing or blocking. You don't know anything about the species of lumber. You don't know about the live load exactly. This is useless information, not just to your client, to any other home inspector reading the report. Stairwell lighting controlled by three-way switches. Do you think there's a client on the planet who understands what a three-way switch is who isn't an electrician? Not a chance. Ground fault circuit interrupters protect exterior receptacles. So what? 
They don't, clients don't understand what a GFCI is. Overflow noted on the kitchen sink. You and I know that's bad. The client would go, oh, that's good. This is, this is gonna start a fight. Furnace capacity, 80,000 BTU per hour, input or output. How many of you tell the client how big the furnace is? I'm guessing most of you. We do it too. Why? What does the client wanna know? Client wants to know, will this furnace keep me warm? Do you know that? No. So instead you give them a piece of useless information. And I'm critical of everybody in the profession, as I say, ourselves included. Think about it. The client wants to know if the furnace will keep them warm. You don't know if the furnace is gonna keep them warm on the coldest day of the year. So instead you tell them how big the furnace is. Doesn't mean anything to him. Induced draft water heater, meaningless. GFI in bathroom and on exterior. So GFCI, by the way, is probably marginally worse than saying ground fault circuit interrupters because they have no idea what those four letters mean. Electrical service entrance overhead. Remember when all the standards asked you to uh, put in whether the electrical service coming to the house was overhead or underground? Could anybody ever explain why that was important? No. Does everybody understand that most of the things in association standards of practice were there to help the report reviewers back in the day when that was how they admitted new members to the association was to allow the report reviewers to get some clue as to whether the uh, candidate inspector knew what he was talking about it doesn't really help the client at all so much of that stuff in the standards of practice completely useless useless to the client thermostats on an exterior wall Again, we know that that's going to cause some problems, but the client doesn't without an implication and an explanation. Utilities were on at the time of the inspection. I'll tell you what, why don't you mention when the utilities were not on at the time of the inspection and tell the client what to do about it? That might be more valuable. Other ones here, furnace blower. Who cares whether it's direct drive or belt drive? Air conditioning, sizing, and water heater BTU rating. Same comment as I made about the furnace. We all do it, but why? Duct material, galvanized fiberglass, is it okay or not? Air filter type, disposable, washable, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. We've already talked about getting rid of a bunch of the site information if you can. Maintenance tips, put them someplace separate out of the body of the report and sharpen your tools. Pretty straightforward. I'm gonna tell you that we've surveyed a bunch of home inspectors and a number that keeps coming back to me is people are spending two and a half hours writing reports. I think that's way too long. But if you apply some of the things that I've been talking about in the last hour, and you can even save yourself, <clears throat> excuse me, 15 minutes on every report. If you do 300 inspections a year, that saves you 75 hours. That's almost two full working weeks. You could spend that time going fishing, doing marketing and building your business, or performing 20 more inspections. And if you took those two weeks and did 20 more inspections, two a day, you would at $400 make $8,000 more a year. That's pretty cool. So decluttering your report pays lots of dividends. Okay, so we've talked about my philosophy a bit, sharpening your tools and report writing best practices. Let me sum up by saying, I would love for you to look at your reports and answer this question. Does every word in my report help my client? Is everything clear, simple, and consistent? And dare you go so far as to say less is more.